really thinks he's going to town. Well, he doesn't realize he's getting ready to fall off of a cliff. Now, <clears throat> to the political spectrum of the world, they think this Mideast situation is just another one of them occurrences. It's because they don't even read in the Bible anything about it. But Arafat, I mean, not Arafat, but Sharon, was in Washington just a few days back to have a meeting with President Bush. And I'm going to read this. It's important to know how the two function together. Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon said he has sent a warning through spatial channels to Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat, warning him to end his sponsorship of terror and violence against the Jewish state of Israel. Leaders will take the matter into their own hands. During a press conference at Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv on Friday after returning from four days of talk in the U.S. with President George W. Bush and other U.S. officials, Sharon said he's confident his message was clear. I passed these messages through very clear channels, he said. I think it is clear. Unfortunately, today the element disrupting security and also blocking the way to a diplomatic agreement is the chairman of the Palestinian Authority, Yasser Arafat. The Israeli officials have said for months that Arafat's sponsorship and direct approval of terrorist activity against the Jewish state has been largely responsible for prolonging the latest round of violence. Sharon did not specify what operational steps he has in mind to stem the rise in terror over the past few days. But he has also said he wants to implement measures to improve life for ordinary Palestinians while striking out against those who continue terrorist activities. Sharon specifically blamed Arafat's personal force 17 guard as taking the Palestinian leader's direction to attack Israeli soldiers and civilians. Sharon held consultations immediately upon his return with high-ranking security officials, Jewish press reports said. Meanwhile, Palestinian cabinet officials meeting in Ramla last night voiced concern that Israel planned to invade Palestine territories and was planning to assassinate high-ranking Palestinian officials. The cabinet repeated an earlier call for a UN-sponsored international force to deploy in an, in an, and monitor PA-controlled areas in Gaza and the West Bank. Sharon said he clearly indicated to Bush's administration officials that Israel would indeed strike out at Palestinian terrorist cells and leaders if the violence did not end soon. Since it was agreed that the sides would not surprise each other, I said very clearly that since we took the step of easing up on economic restrictions and the Palestinians' reaction was an increase in the level of terror, that we will work against these terror elements, he told reporters. This was made clear there while there will be no surprises. Also, while in Washington, D.C., Sharon said he spoke with Bush about the rising threat of weapons of mass destruction being developed by Iraq and Iran. Such weapons pose an increasingly dire rise to Israel, Sharon said. Sharon also said that even though stability in the Middle East is a joint Israeli-American interest, Israel will not be the one willing to pay the price for this stability. I think this point is very clear to the administration, he said. We are the supporters of regional stability. It is one of our goals, but any arrangement that will be taken cannot be taken at Israel's expense. Sharon said the talks with President Bush went well and were warm. He added that Israel and the U.S. see eye to eye, eye regarding the cause of the deterioration in re regional stability over the, the past few years. I found a joint concern about the dangers to stability that are embedded in terror and the need to fight it, said Sharon. I found support for Israel and its right to protect its citizens. Israel has been criticized by the former Clinton administration as well as most industrialized nations for what was characterized as overreaction and unnecessary use of force against warring Palestinian factions. Since the latest violence began September the 28th, ironically, ironically, after Sharon visited the holy sites in Jerusalem, which angered Palestinian activists. Though exhausted, 
Sharon said he has succeeded in establishing good relations with the new Bush administration and has laid the foundation for a continuation of talks and cooperation. Now, you don't get that from our news media here in the States. It only goes to show how liberal and concerned they are because they think everything's just going to go on, just like always. They don't even realize that there's anything in the prophetic making ready to take place. Now, if you have your Bibles this morning, I have what I feel is a very interesting message. The Lord laid it upon my heart while I was in Mexico. And there was another going to follow this. I am so sick and tired of hearing these modern critics, no matter what kind of degrees they have in anything. If you say anything in their presence about the coming of the Lord, they want to rise up and speak out against such talk. And they make it appear that you're arrogant. You're fanatics. You have no right to believe in such stuff. Well, how do you know when the Lord's coming? How many of, uh, of you in here are used to the signs how to get here? Think seriously this morning. If you was to start from here to somewhere down in Kentucky, if you've never been there, would you not go to some kind of a map and pick out what particular road you might take? Would you not? Would you not at every intersection look and see the highway signs, which one that you're wanting on, which way you would go? You pay, uh, you pay attention to the natural signs. But then for arrogant, ignorant, educated people to say, but the Bible don't say when he's coming. But it gives you a lot of signs. Yes, it does. It's true Jesus said in Matthew 24, no man knoweth the day or the hour. Notice he said the day or the hour. He said nothing about a month or a year or approximately of time. So that's the purpose this morning. We're not here preaching to you a day or an hour. But we are going to point to you, brothers and sisters, that there is an approximate period of time when all these biblical signs are going to terminate. And we're foolish and we're blind if we don't begin to read the road signs. So turn with me in Luke's writing in the 21st chapter. <clears throat> I'm beginning in the 25th verse. Because when Luke recorded this, here is where his writings comes to the end time for our day and hour. I like the way he laid it out. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon. Now all of this takes place in the week of Daniel. And in the stars upon the earth, distress of nations. Well, it's going on. With perplexity, confusion, I mean, the sea and the waves roaring, that's symbolically of the masses of people that are reaching a discontent attitude. In Korea, they're doing it. In Indonesia, they're doing it. And in Africa, in certain areas, in Zimbabwe, they're doing it. People are tired of being oppressed. They're reaching out to lay the blame on the next person or so forth. So forth. So the distress of nation is not something we're ignorant to. In fact, it's so commonplace, we have took it for granted that this is the way it's always been. It's not that way. The seas and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, which are coming on the earth and for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. That's the end time effect. 
And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. That's the end consummation. With power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass. Now notice, he goes back. And picks up again. When you see these signs, these things begin to come to pass. Then look up. You going to pay attention to the politicians? Are you going to pay attention to Professor Faust Dick? Does he know it all? Does Darwin have the answer? While we was coming out of Mexico, we picked up a, uh, a paper. They've now found another skull in Africa. They say this is going to tear the whole thing all to pieces. What scientists have said about the development of man. They claim this skull is at least three and a half million years old. I hope they get so confused before the end of time, brothers and sisters, they'll cough up their false teeth. I'm on my own grounds now. And he spoke to them a parable. Now Matthew records this in the 24th chapter. But Luke, by investigating, heard that there was more said. Behold the fig tree. Well, that's what was Matthew wrote about. But notice Luke says, and all the trees. Now what's he talking about? Behold the fig tree and all the trees. Notice the next verse. When they is a plural, it's not a singular. When they, all the trees, shoot forth. Ye see and know that the fig that, that your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. Any person in their right mind can begin to tell when they're coming to spring. All I have to do is look out my kitchen window and on a bush line leading south along the line of the property. All the red buds are swelling. That lets me know spring's just around the corner. A few weeks later, brothers and sisters, they'll all be leafed out. They'll be blooming out. We'll know that summer's nigh. If those things are indicators to the natural man that we are, why did Jesus use such a parable? What he's actually saying, when you see these things that represents or symbolize in these trees, you see it going on, then you know his coming is approaching. So likewise ye when you see these things come to pass, know you that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Now the title of our talk this morning is this generation. This is not something other that is just synonymous. Jesus had in mind there is a particular generation that would be at the end time, that would see the starting of these signs, and they would not all be in the ground. They might be walking on canes and such, but they would be alive when this is all over and Jesus has truly come. That's an infallible testimony that God's word is true, whether the scientists, the evolutionists want to believe it or not. Verily, verily, I said to you, this generation... What generation? Not any synonymous generation. No. This generation that can look back and say, I remember when this all began to start. They can see it progress up to the present day. They can see how certain things from the Bible was criticized, condemned, belittled, talked about. And you as a Christian are considered as trash on the earth. That don't stop the signs at all. This generation that sees these things. Now we want to establish, well, how long is it a generation in this respect? Did not the Apostle Paul say three score and ten years? That's a lot of the present man. Sure, a lot of men are living longer than that, but a lot are dying shorter than that. But remember, 70 years is going to cover this generation. We've got to look back and see approximately where did that start. But let's go on. 
<clears throat> for these signs keep on going. Notice the 33rd verse. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Did he literally mean that the earth and the heavens are going to disappear? He didn't mean that at all. He used that as a symbolic illustration. It would be easier for the heavens and the earth to pass out of existence than for my word to not come to pass. Because you know, and I know that the coming of the Lord is to establish a kingdom on this earth. So we can say then, the old world system as we see it now is going to fade away one of these days. And the spirit world will no longer have demons and devils infiltrating in it, disrupting the, the communication of that which is right. Now, let's go on to, to a few more verses. Notice he said, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting. Now this word don't mean out here water skiing on the beach. You know what it means? And take heed to yourselves, least at any time your hearts be overcharged with excess of everything. Well, I need this. Well, I want a better this. I want more of this. Well, I just live for that. Look around your society today. This is the day that the modern man of America has become an excessive glutton for everything that he thirsts after. He can't get enough. He's never content. He's never even happy. He wants something better. While other thirds of the world, brothers and sisters, hardly have a thing. They live in the dust and the dirt of the earth itself. So let's keep in mind, brothers and sisters, Jesus was giving you and I a description of our day and time. Yes, at cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Now some people don't even know what a snare is. My mother years ago didn't think I knew how to make one. So I'll tell you about it. I watched a cousin of mine set some snares. He was catching rabbits and selling them for 15 cents apiece. Now this is back in the Depression days. So I went home. And I said, I was going to make me a snare. Now I asked Daddy to get me some snare cord. What do you want it for? I said, I want to make a snare. Oh, you can't make a snare. You don't know how. Well, one evening when I came home from school, Dad had got me this little ball of snare cord. Now I went up on a little hillside right above a, an old pasture plot. Now how you make it? You cut some sticks. And you set them in a pin. You drive them in the ground. You set them in a pin shape. Sort of like a round corral. But you leave one place that's kind of open. And in there, you find you a forked stick. You turn it upside down and you drop it in the ground just right there where that's at. Okay, you bend another one over here and cut the top of it off and you fasten your twine to that. And you bring it down in here and you fasten a little cross stick in the string here so that you can put it in this cross stick with a bait stick on it. I was using a piece of apple. And then you make a loop and you set it over this hole that you don't put sticks in. The, the idea is the rabbit smells the bait. He comes to trotting up, but he realizes he goes around and he, until he finds this hole. Well, when he sees this hole, he just reaches through there and he starts nibbling on that little apple. But after a while, he takes one big bite and he jerks that little stick out from the trigger item. Bingo. Well, I made that thing and come in for supper and Mommy made fun of me. But I went to school the next day. And when we come home, we had to walk three miles through the wood to the school. Come home the next evening and Mother met me at the door and said, guess what we're going to have for supper? <laughs> Sometime in the morning after me and my sister we had done gone off to school, we had a big old white-legged rooster. He went up there prowling around, and next thing she looked up there, and she saw that white-legged rooster hanging up in the air like that. My dad never did tell me no more. You don't know how to make a snare. Because we had rooster for supper. I've made box snares. 
box traps and things like that to catch rabbits in. So when Jesus said, for as a snare shall it come, and I have to say today, brothers and sisters, the world is baited right now for millions of people to be caught in this trap. Not ready, not caring, disbelieving that it can't be. Well, it's coming, and it's close at hand. So, watch ye therefore and pray, always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. There is a possibility that there are some people on earth today that can pass this. It's not mean that you don't see it, but your life will be absolutely spared from the effects of it. You can see all this loose living, but don't they look nice? It depends what you look at as being nice. TV is getting more vulnerable to the spectator's view every day. The modern women anchor news media women. They can't strip off enough. They say to you, that's my business. Sure, it's your business, but it's my business to tell you the Bible discredits it. You may think you look pretty, but in the eyes of God, you stink. Oh, Brother Jackson, why in the Bible in the Old Testament did God in the law, in the ordinances, tell the children of Israel, when you come into the land and you build certain edifices, you will not build steep steps. Least you look upon your brother's nakedness. Well, brothers and sisters, you, today walking down the sidewalk, you got to turn completely around. Never look like you're a fool. It walks right in front of you. Young people, 60 years ago, if a person that you see today on the streets was to appear then, they would have arrested them for indecent, indecent behavior. They would have. <clears throat> but it's come about so gradual. People have become hardened to it, blinded to reality, because they have nothing before them to look back to. And I have to say, that's why there is a Christian people either going to be strong enough to live up to it and to present the image of what's right, or they're too going to be just sucked in to the tide of this world image of modern flesh. So now then this morning I said, my subject is dealing with this generation. Let's take a look at this generation. About approximately when did it happen? When did it start? To make my best approach, I'm going to take you back to the start of the 20th century. At the beginning of the 20th century of 2000. I mean, 1900. The world, for many years, had been took up with the era of colonialism. Through that period of time, England, in the latter part of 1700, all through 1800s, had spread her outreach all over the globe. She became the largest maritime nation in the world. It used to be said when I was a boy going to school, the, British, the sun never sets on a British flag. She was on the islands across the Pacific. She was in India, parts of Burma. She used the cities of Hong Kong, which we know today, and Singapore. But I was reading an article a few years back. When English established these two seaports, one coming out of China, one coming out of Malaysia. These became the exporting centers of the Oriental tea trade. In that period of time, nations began to build what they called the fast sailboats. They were known as the tall ships. Each nation was out to build the fastest one that he could get the job of transporting this wealth from the Far East. Hong Kong was in the hand of the British just tell a, a few years back. You should remember when the, if you listen to the news when England turned it back over to the China rule. 
Those Chinese that had been born and raised under this British colonial hold really didn't want to turn it back. But China wanted it back. Singapore absolutely belonged to the British for a long period of time. When the Japanese invaded this whole area of the world, they conquered this. They took it from the British. How do I know? Because in World War II, on the island in the Gilberts, the Japanese had taken two turret guns that belonged to the British Seacoast Artillery, 12-inch turret guns. They brought them from there to this mid-Pacific atoll. Still had the British brass plate insignias on them, what outfit it was. But it was still under the control of the British. You remember Muhammad, Muhammad Gandhi or whatever his name was? He fasted and prayed for independence. But I bring this one out. Portugal had a hold in Pakistan. Africa, look at it. French, Equatorial Africa, Belgium, the Congo, Britain, Ghana, Kenya. The country of Kenya was the pearl of Africa during that colonial period. Big hotels built. Then you go to South Africa. You had German holes. You had well, uh, as well as British holes. But the Dutch was in the Far East, in the Dutch East Indies. These were the areas of trees, nations, colonialism. These little nations was crying for independence. Then came World War II. No sooner does World War II come to close, and that was the beginning of a reshuffling, reorganizing, and repositioning of nations, peoples, and stuff. It wasn't long, brothers and sisters, we gave the Philippines their independence. England wasn't long, she was taking the flags down, and here she comes home. Today, brothers and sisters, the flag of England is flying over on the British Isles, nowhere else. It used to be the, Mo the Moors was in Spain, up to 1492. Then the Spaniards rose up and expelled the Jews and the Moors, which is the Moroccans. Then shortly after that, Spain crossed back over and took over Morocco, and it used to be called Spanish Morocco. My point is this. There was a period of time coming into the 20th century that colonialism flourished. Some people will say, well, it should never have been. You don't even know what you're talking about. I don't care if you're a school teacher, you got a degree a mile long. If you've never been there, all you can do is read some historians' comments in a book. But I've been there. Let me say this. Had there never been colonialism, none of those nations today would have electric light. None of them would have a railroad. No, sir. None of them would even know what a train was, what it sounded like. But 1978, when we was in India for the first time, we rode a train from Bombay to Basawa, a hundred and some miles. As we were sitting on the train, I thought to myself, had the British never been here, there would not have been this train. We would have been traveling by ox cart. Shortly after World War II and I come home, I heard a Belgian missionary that had spent time there in the con in the in the Belgian Congo. Now I'm telling you the truth. When the Belgians went in there, they cut their way into the interiors, to these tribes. The jungle is so congested with vines and wild things, taking machetes to cut their way through. It wasn't long till the Belgianese troops began to come in to keep peace among the tribes. Because they found that a lot of times these tribes was constantly at one another's throat. And in that period of time, brothers and sisters, in the Congolese, if they got you, they didn't bury you. They ate you. It reminds me of the little joke that goes like this. Two British women, they had decided they wanted to be missionaries to the interior of Africa. Now, it's a joke, so don't get offended at it. 
But they wanted to go where there was the most back set people there was. And they made their way into this area, this tribe. That's roofed in mud huts. And they started trying to missionary and preach to these natives. But some of them got mad one day. The chief was gone. And when evening come, they done had these two old ladies that were supposed to be missionaries tied. And they had a great big pot on a heating. They had hot water boiling. When the chief came in and asked, what's going on? Well, then some of the others said, Mm. Supper. He looked at him tied, ready to be thrown in the pot. He said, Leftovers. <laughs> now, that would be offensive for me to say that on a TV program today, but I'll turn around and look right at you in the pie face. I've been in islands where they still lived like that. So don't tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. And there's some of them in New Guinea yet. Because I've got a picture upstairs in a book. Shows them packing up one black man, being packed by another bunch of black men. Back to their tribe, they're going to have him the next day after they barbecue him. I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, today, there's a bunch of politicians and educators today. Shut that tough kind of talk up. Well, I'm on my own grounds. If you want to listen to me, listen to me. If you don't, it won't hurt my feelings. But I stand here today to tell you the truth. We're living in a generation that has saw all these things coming about on this earth. Either we wake up and begin to realize something or another, that Jesus is coming soon. And he's going to tolerate all this political, educative nonsense. He's going to set up a kingdom of his own. And the righteous and the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. But the wicked shall not. In the book of Psalms it says that I saw the wicked spreading himself like a big, big green bay tree. But the writer says, I saw him in his latter state. He was not. He's going to come to the end and he's going to come down fast. So when we begin to look at this, when World War II came, it was God's beginning of these nations reaching a point in time. They felt like they had been under colonialism too long. So they each one began to cry. The United Nations was set up. And in the United Nations, all these cries and these things they were begging for began to be established. At the same time, notice the fig tree was the first thing that the United States, I mean the United Nations dealt with. In the month of May, the 8th, 1948, in the night's time, President Truman suggested when the General Assembly came to the vote, what will we do with these displaced Jewish people in Europe? He suggested, and he got a unanimous vote, that we will establish a homeland in the land of Palestine. They pick out the areas in the land of Palestine where the most Jews had immigrated back in the latter years of 1780 and so on and so forth. All right? So they voted Israel to be a, a state. No sooner did they do that, brothers and sisters, than the Arabs began to rise up. We will not allow it. Now let us go back and pick up England. From 1700 to 1800, she has begun to make her inroads throughout the globe. But as she comes into 1800, she takes over Egypt, reaching up into the Sinai away. She was the largest maritime nation under the sun. She had to bring all her wealth, which is her commerce, from the different areas of colonial trade. She brought it on ships. In order to shorten the route, instead of going around Africa, she's the one that engineered the Suez Canal. Look it up in history. She might have had some German engineers, I do not know. But she was the one that masterminded. She built it just like we did at Panama. But we gave it up. All right. When World War I came, 
France was in Lebanon. When World War I ended, Britain had now, from Egypt all the way to the land of Israel, she had taken over. It forced Turkey to get out. And Turkey, while she was a long time ramrod of things in there, one of her prophets of old supposed to have said, when General Allenby, not even, the man wasn't even existent yet, and the Nile River shall flow through the streets of Jerusalem. Then we will know that it's time for us Turks to get out. And I've got the history book that shows these water tank wagons. When the Britons left the Sinai area near the Suez, heading their way to Jerusalem, General Allenby was the engineer of this thrust. He figured that the Turks would poison all the water. So they had a few old trucks, but a lot of horse-drawn water wagons. They brought the waters right out of the Nile River, right to Jerusalem, and there they sat there in the gutters, drip, and drip, 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 drip. And when the Turks began to see this and analyze it, they said, it's time for us to go. And so, brothers and sisters, they went out. And the Middle East stayed under the British and the French control till we come on later. Now we come on in then, brothers and sisters, to World War II. World War II, the beginning of it starts in 39. So I'm going to ask you, if 70 years is a generation, 70 years from 39 takes you to 2009. These signs are not put in the Bible for nothing. That's well in the week of Daniel, just before it closes out. That's why I said we could be a year and a half wrong because we don't know that the Roman calendar is right. But we could give it at least a year and a half, vice versa. We're not trying to tell you the year or the hour. I mean the day or the hour. But we're showing you the proximity of time that the Lord is absolutely coming to this earth to bring an end to all this violence, sickness, political unrest, instability, and this thing of people being dissatisfied when they've got everything that some have. So Jesus said, now notice he's looking down through time to your day and my day, our generation. Behold the fig tree and all the other trees. So he didn't isolate Israel. Just watch it. Watch all these other trees. When you all begin to see them getting their independence, their national identity. Brothers and sisters, had colonialism never been there, none of these little trees would ever known what a car, an automobile, electric lights, or anything was. Look at Indonesia, an area of unrest today. It's that Muslim religion. I showed on, they showed on the news last night over in Afghanistan where some of the guerrilla fighters have blown up these Buddhist caves, statues, and stuff. And the Muslims over there said, well, it's all pagan, heathenism, ought to be blown up. Well, and the world's crying out, well, but, it, but, but it's archaeological. It's nice to look at. Wait till God gets through with this Islamic spirit. There's going to be a lot of things blown up. And there's going to be a lot of educated people that are going to like it. God's just letting people go ahead and think what they want to tell you, say what they want to do, act like they want to, say what to anybody they want to, but God's going to bring it all to halt one of these days because he's got a, he got a plan, plan and a way he's going to close this whole thing out and he's going to be recognized. So we're looking at all these trees, how they begin to bloom. They're putting out their buds, their national independency. But did you know, brothers and sisters, not a one of them, can exist on its own and produce its own economy. Every one of them have thrived on aid from various nations. I have to say, brothers and sisters, there's something wrong somewhere. That's why I've said for a long time, you can squawk about colonialism. So you kick them out. But because you have tasted of the things that the colonial powers gave you, now then you want to stay in that bracket 
give me, give me, give me, give me. It don't make sense to me. You want to be free. To do what? Live your own culture. On the radio, shortly after I got home from the war, a Belgian missionary, after they're out, he said when we went into Belgium, we cut our way in, we cut our roads in where we could drive these trucks, these vehicles into these camps. We taught these people. Certain things about how to live in peace, how to plant a garden, how to harvest it. But he says, as soon as we leave, they throw everything out that we taught. And it wasn't long. The pigs, they roam in and out of the huts. And the little school buildings, they started raising chickens in them. And I heard that missionary say that with my own ears. So don't look at me and tell me that colonialism was so bad wrong. It gave the, them people a taste of something or other. And up to a point they, watched, they still want some of it. But they like that old culture. And I've said this, brothers. There are some cultures I wouldn't honor it if I had a billion dollars. You'll either change or perish in your own ignorance. And that's what most of them tried to become. Because their lifestyle is not very long. Because they don't want to learn. And they don't want you to tell them. Leave me alone. Well, I don't go for everything, brothers and sisters, that the educated world has said. But I will say this. When it's time to get up in the morning, it's time to get up. What do you mean by that, Brother Jackson? Well, if school's going to be at 8.30, and you come dragging in at 9 or 9.30, that might be permissible one day in a month or two days. But you want it to be like that every day. That's why George Brown said, used about Jamaica people. He said, when 7 o'clock here, it's 8 or 8.30 down in Jamaica. Because that's the way they like to gauge time. They, like to, they don't like to move fast. They want to live according to their culture. Brother Jackson, I could listen to you if you wouldn't say things like this. Well, you wait, you wait till we get closer to the coming of the Lord. Amen. I'm liable to say a lot more things. You might not want to even be here. You don't want Jesus to rule and reign, do you? You don't want him to change this stinking world, do you? Well, listen to what the Bible says. And in that day, he will take his rightful throne, which is the seat of David. Where's that at? Jerusalem. And the law shall go forth from Zion. And the world war from Jerusalem. And all nations shall flow to Zion and Jerusalem to worship, but not only to worship, but to learn. I'll tell you one thing, brothers and sisters. That's why he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. To erase from this world a lot of this ignorance of things that are right and get rid of a lot of things that aren't right. And I have to say America's full of it. We've got men today, brothers and sisters, they live up here in the elite class. They're the kind of men that says, and I've got the the article, brothers and sisters, they're saying the time is coming when only certain people should be allowed to be parents of children and that they should have a government license to give birth to a child. Why? Because, brothers and sisters, they don't want the children to be taught anything about God. No, we don't need religion. What a shame. Yes. They'll take the ear off of a wise man. They'll take some skin off of an idiot of their class. Collode it. They'll take the sperm of a certain educated intellectual man. 
an artificial inseminate a woman. Ask her what, what kind of a child you want. It's going on. And I have to say, brothers and sisters, if the modern world today is allowed to succeed and implement their pra uh, plans, the day will come, brothers and sisters, the common down-to-earth people that are simple, that would have a mind to even want to learn anything about God, you'll be shut up. You'll be cut off. Don't say it won't. It will. Already right in here is a letter. The ACLU, the American Civil Liberty Union, ain't nothing but a branch of communism. They're rising up with all power to contest the Ten Commandments, to destroy it all over America, wherever it is portrayed. And I have to say, brothers and sisters, any idiots that's like that, God has allowed him to have about 55 years to propagate his ideas. But the hour is going to come when God's going to shut them kind of mouths up. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm not caring how soon that is. Because I can remember, brothers and sisters, when everybody in America didn't go to church. But there's one thing, sure, we live together. And those that didn't go to church didn't talk about those that did. Our children went to the same public schools, and we didn't pack guns to shoot. Look at now America. And I have to say, modern man, liberal-minded, education that you want, you've asked for it. Now God's given it to you till it runs out your ears. You cry a thousand crocodile tears. What caused it? You put God out. This was a nation that used to be known to the world. That's a Christian nation. That didn't mean everybody in here was a Christian, but it meant this was a society that had been affected by the Bible. Our laws basically was, we will say, arranged from the structure of the Bible laws. And now look at it. Fifty years we became a society, perverts, lesbians. Women hate men, and some men hate women. Do you think, brothers and sisters, God's going to tolerate this forever? No. I have said this, brothers and sisters, for the last 50 years, the Bible spoke of certain things that was to materialize in this end time as a sign. It has. It's came to pass. Men have consented to it. People have agreed with it. While the Christians have had to take a back seat. They don't want them to say anything anymore. Don't even mention Jesus in a public place. That's almost like a curse word. Don't mention him in a school. Or we'll rise up against you. We will get you for instigating a riot. There is an element of people that wants America to stay just like this, only get worse. And then cry every time some knothead takes a shotgun or a pistol to school to shoot somebody. You consented to it, you liberal minded characters. Look at the internet. I've got an item at home says. On the internet, our youth today is exposed to all of this child pornography stuff. They're being educated by the modern, liberal-minded, we will say influential leaders. When I was a boy, brothers and sisters, there was only certain places you could find a pornography magazine. But as the police department found out where that was at, they would usually go and confiscate the stuff. That didn't mean there wasn't secret places somewhere that was exposable. But the average newspaper rack, brothers and sisters, was not filled with this junk. Then our entertainment, Hollywood, is nothing but a hellhole. Listen to me. They just passed out Grammy Awards. I don't care if they're as big as a mountain. They ain't nothing but a bunch of perverts lives out there. Whoremongers, 
prostitutes, married a half a dozen times. And then the, ne the news media programmed them characters as role models for our young society to pattern their lives after. Run from it! You don't need to look like that nor act like that. It's a sign of the end time. Called brothers and sisters, it produced a generation of parents that don't want to be liable for that little child they bring into the world. I'm not speaking for every case. But every time that sun goes down in the west on an evening, I can just imagine across this land there's a little child. I want my daddy. Imagine a little, a little two-year-old child would like to feel the strong arms of his daddy about his little bosom. I'll never forget in the Depression days when I've seen my mommy and daddy sitting talking about the problems. But I could overhear them say, well, everything will work out all right. Many times my dad would take me and set me on his knees and said, Junior, I'm sorry we can't get you everything for Christmas that you would like. But says, one of these days, I'm sure the good Lord will make things different. It was the way he spoke to me and put his arms around me and let me know he loved me. Because my dad always did provide. Because when the sun would go down, we would always have bread. We would always have maybe a piece of bacon or ham and some good old ham gravy. And I'll tell you, there ain't nothing equal to it. <clears throat> and sometimes when a mother would get up in the morning, she would clean a bunch of beans. And she would set that pot on the stove in one of them old cast iron pots. And when she did, she made it enough for dinner and she made it enough for supper. I remember the old hillbilly song, beans for breakfast, beans for dinner, beans for supper too. And let me wahoo. <laughs> so brothers and sisters, yes, and we could yodel from one end of the hilltop to the other. Didn't have no pennies to pack around. But as long as we had a good biscuit with a fried egg on it and another biscuit with a piece of ham on it and maybe another with some peanut butter and jelly on it, this was usually our school lunch and we walked three miles to school. Hallelujah. When dinner time came, we were glad to go take that brother and sister to devour it. And we come home just as happy as a lot of these kids do today, brother and sister, they've got everything and ain't happy with nothing. Now, I'm not running the young people down, but I am saying, brother and sister, the youth of this hour, keep your eyes open. You're given a chance to look at something. Take a good look at it, because it'll never be this way again. One of these days, God's going to bring the whole thing to an end. He's coming for a people that's got their eyes open, their ears unstopped, and their hearts ready. And I'm thankful. Well, I can look back, brothers and sisters. I can see all these little nations. They got their independence. We can say, brothers and sisters, we've seen Israel get her independence. But she's been in a constant struggle for 50 years to survive, to exist. That will not go on forever. It will go on for a certain period of time. Then that thing's going to change. And so when I say these things, brothers and sisters, this situation in the Middle East is just not another political uprising. I said yesterday, brothers and sisters, one well, of the big shots of the Palestinian organization is making his way now to where the, all the Arab states are going to have a big meeting next week, big conference, the first they've had since the Gulf War. Now, I wonder what they're going to talk about. I bet I know it's going to be Israel. What do you say we ought to do? Now, Yasser Arafat opened his big mouth and said he will never give up until the Palestinian flag flies over Jerusalem, the Holy Temple Mount, and all the land. And old Iraq has said, we are preparing troops to go to liberate Jerusalem. Well, I have to say, brothers and sisters, according to the Bible, and you've never heard the news say so much about Jerusalem in all the history as you have in the last year and a half. Jerusalem is the fuse. That's why Zechariah 12 said, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. Because the Palestinians want it, 
They want it for the capital of their state, and they're not going to have it. They're not going to get it. Because, brothers and sisters, according to the Isaiah, the 49th chapter, they that made the east will be far removed. Twice he says it. That means all them Palestinians one day, here's what going to say to them as they bring out the army trucks. Get your suitcase back. Because you've seen that hut the last time you're going to see it. Well, I don't think that's right. Well, who are you to tell God something's not right? There's not a politician on the face of this earth that's got a right to override the Bible and say this ain't right. God should have a right to do what he wants to. And he's going to. He's going to disappoint a lot of people. He's going to send a lot of people, brothers and sisters, home crying. Well, I feel so sorry for them. You ought to have thought of that a long time ago. Before you let your mind get so wrapped up in such modern ideas. <clears throat> even we've got modern religion today, modern churches, that can't even see the handwriting on the wall. And I have to say this morning, it's a sad picture that we see this situation going on in the Middle East. Because when it does explode, the world is going to be right at the threshold of the week of Daniel. That don't mean it's going to begin then. Because following right on the heels of that, it's going to be Ezekiel 38. And I'll never forget when that war is fought, brothers and sisters, it's not going to be something that lasts for days. It's all going to be over in a day's time. Because there ain't going to be no shots fired. Oh, Brother Jackson, I said there's not going to be no shots fired. There ain't none of them troops going to be killed by a bullet. God's going to do it himself by an atmospheric condition. Read it. When battles are fought, there's usually an area. It might cover two or three miles in length or such. But when it's fought by gunpowder, bullets, and such, it usually leaves the men laying, scattered here and there. At least they don't have to hire men for seven months to go look for them. Hear me. But what did God's Word say? Israel will hire men for seven months to go out and regather these. Well, what do you think happened to them? God's going to let a tornado storm hit that Middle East. That's, there's never been probably one in the world like it. Listen to some of our own media tell the effects of some of our tornadoes. As that monster devil comes swishing in, suddenly there's a torrential rain. And again, here's absolutely cubes of ice, big as a baseball, hidden. What is it? It's a complete atmospheric disturbance that takes this water in such a swirl and freezes it and then drops it again. What does it say in Ezekiel? I will rain upon him a great rain and hail. No, that's not going to be them little old pinochle things. Just, just knocks the paint over the hood of your car. You're going to have to take it and have it repainted that mic or whoever's at over here. By the time it gets through with the hood of your car, brother, and said, you're going to need a new hood. Because <clears throat> when God does it, he does it right. But he gave the world enough a warning. Because he said when he sees that, that fury comes up in his face. And when God gets red in the face, not that you're going to see it that way, but that's an expression of mine. He's going to say, I got a surprise for you. I said it long ago, but you didn't believe it. Now then, you just watch the show. <clears throat> Boy, I tell you, when I come home from World War II, these radio preachers was preaching, all oh, Russia's in the greatest horse breeding program they've ever been. What are they? They're getting ready for Ezekiel 38. What a nonsense. What good is a bunch of horses coming down the road when now they got laser beams? What good do you think they're going to do? It's horsepower. So brothers and sisters, and it'll come right on the heels. 
It's going to absolutely force this world right into the week of Daniel. Just right the way it's supposed to be. And I have to say, young people, you may not realize it, but you're young in flesh and heart and everything. But if your heart is right, you're going to be able to watch the show. You're going to be able to see it with your own eyes and hear it with your own ears. Yes, we can look back now on some old videos of the Gulf War. But that's 10 years ago. 10 years have brought a lot of improvement to the techno technology of weaponry. So I'm saying this morning, the Middle East, it's a staging area. It's the stage. God is slowly dealing. He's allowing circumstances to develop. He's getting all the actors and the participants to begin to line themselves and take their position on the stage. Because this thing's going according to the book. And one of these days, brothers and sisters, when all them actors, them nations are in place, somebody's going to say the wrong thing, and they're going to press the wrong button, and God's going to say to Israel, Now! You know what? You read Obadiah and see what it says. You read also what it says also in Isaiah. In that day, he will use Israel to chastise Edom. Now, we've got a lot of people today in setting in church. Well, what about Edom? Well, go and read Obadiah. 600 B.C. When God said he would bring the Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, to chastise Israel for her refusing to obey him. Here come that Nebuchadnezzar army. On three different occasions, they tore down the countryside. They eventually, brothers and sisters, in their last thrust, they took the last captives and them Edomites over on the other side of the Jordan River. That was Jacob's brother, the present generation's cousins. And Obadiah said, you laughed. You stood over there and jumped up and down, tear it down, tear it down. Then that was theirs will be ours. And that's what they've done for the last number of years. But every time I get to thinking like this, brothers and sisters, my mind goes to Babylon 500 years before Christ, just before they're released to come home. Look at that Babylonian work detail men sent out there to supervise over these poor Israeli people. Yes, they hung their harps on the willow trees along the Euphrates River. And them old Babylonians will say to them, Jewish servant people come on sing us another song don't that sound like a tyrant wanting to tease you come on sing us another hillbilly melody and every time they'd open that big mouth sing us another song of Zion some poor old Jew would be weeping cutting down weeds trying to make the river bank look clean would say how can we sing the songs of Zion in a strange land. And then out of that list would come words like this. Oh Jerusalem. If I forget thee. May my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. And then they would say. Oh Lord. Remember Edom. In the day of Jerusalem. Gentiles you're looking right at it. You're looking right at it. The world has lost track in the Bible. But God sure hasn't. Yes, and Zephaniah the second chapter says, And the Ammonites will serve them. And the Moabites will become a land like Sodom and Gomorrah. One of these days, brothers and sisters, God's going to say to Israel, You have put up with their arrogancy long enough. They have harassed you. They set their terrorists against you. Now then. And Obadiah said. 
that God would use Israel to repay the Edomites just for what they had did. And I have to say, America! And all of you that's never heard this, don't cry when you see it start taking place. They belittled Sharon when he went into Lebanon in 82. And some of the things that he did. His idea was to put enough of fear in them Palestinians to stop this nonsense. Leave us alone. But did they know? And I have to say to you this morning, brothers and sisters, young people, it's wonderful to be sympathetic. But whenever your sympathy feelings become more than what you think God's are, you're heading for a disappointment. Because when I go back to the book of Joshua, and after 40 years of wandering and sitting in the wilderness, they stayed out there in that hot desert, and they ate man of a morning, and quail even the evening, and God gave them water. They sust he sustained them. But when they come to the Jordan River, and was ready to come into this land, God told Joshua, when you go in, and you come past the city, be sure now you have sympathy on all the little babies. They're such sweet, cuddly little things to play with. No, but when they get up big, they're just like their pappy was. They got a concept just like their grandpa did. And you'll find it, brothers and sisters, in the whole letter of Joshua, 30 cities, 30 different people. Joshua conquered he destroyed everyone. And I have to say, when God uses Israel this time, no, I'm not saying she's going to destroy everything, everybody, but she's going to destroy enough that when they're done, Saudi Arabia, which is the camp that Islam came out of, she's going to come crawling at Israel's feet. And when Israel's ready to build their temple, oh, we're, we're, we're right there with you. Try them now. Send them word now, see what they do. Read it. 60th chapter of Isaiah. All of this is going to happen in a generation of time. And that's before Jesus is still on earth. Your eyes are going to see it. And there's not a politician in New York that's going to stop it. When God gets, takes Israel and absolutely knocks that Arab world to pieces, Islam in that respect is going to be dead. Then the next bunch is what you see in Ezekiel 38. Yes, that's the Iranians. That's the Afghanistans. That's the Turks. That's the Libyans. That's the Ethiopians. They stay. Wanna, they want to have a whack at it. And that's why, brother and sister, you study that Ezekiel 38 very careful. You'll see there's not a shot even fired. And when God gets through with that, brother and sister, there ain't going to be no United Nations. The Western world is going to be in such disarray, confounded and confused. It's just like the prophet Micah said, in that day, the heathen will become so confounded, so surprised. They'll come crawling out of their holes with their hands over their mouth. I didn't know this. Well, some, do, some are going to know it. And I say this morning, there are hundreds of people across America and in the other parts of the world knows exactly what's taking place. Because we published it. Now I have to say this morning, I'm not done with this message. I'll finish it up tonight. But I do want to read to you a little something. And then I will close this morning. Somebody handed me this item. It's a writing by a, 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 of a certain girl in a certain school somewhere is her name. I'll find it here directly. Rebecca Floyd. She fell in line with some kind of a new, I, I have to call it witchcraft. Because anything that's related to the same developments and the fulfillment and doing the same things. And she has demonstrated this. She's discussed it for her whole class. 
I want to ask you, why won't they let you come into your schools and talk about Jesus? What's gone wrong? I remember when they did. When her mother heard about her taking up this study, she says that she had studied witchcraft at first. She got scared of it. You start playing with the devil. He'll change clothes on you every time. Yes, he will. She calls it Wicca. It could be Mickey. Just so they don't call it witchcraft. But she's made a candle move across the table. There's no words in that Bible that Christians was ever to practice such nonsense. So it goes to show you that our educative system today have become full of the devil. They become blinded and ignorant to reality. Just don't talk about Jesus. Let's just go ahead. If you want to play voodooism. America is getting ripe for a bad case of ignoritis. And it's going to be bad. When God, there's her picture. She tells there. Any girl would have ever appeared in school when I was going to school, brothers and sisters, they would have run her home. Look it over, brother. So, brothers and sisters, I'm going to bring this message to a close this morning. But let me say this before I dismiss you. America is getting ready for a shaking. Something's going to shake it to the bone. To the hilt. Otherwise, brothers and sisters, you're going to see your, the society in America go completely over the cliff into utterly intellectual oblivion. And I will say, when the news media become so full, but why? Now they're wanting to begin to study the characters that come to school. Is he one that could pack a gun? You reckon he can make a pipe bomb? Well, you can see all that nonsense on the internet. And you say anything to them about claiming down a, oh, but we believe in freedom of expression. It wasn't that way, brother and sister. When I was a little boy, freedom of expression goes up, brothers and sisters, to a certain point. That's decency. Manners. Principles. Beyond that, it's hellish. But we've got absolutely intellectual brains in America today. They want to be so liberal-minded. We want freedom of expression. But then when some knothead comes into school and kills half a dozen, then they want to study and spend dollars and taxpayer money. Why did he have to do that? Somebody ought to have alerted us. I'll say this. If you hadn't kicked God out, he would have. We never had that 60 years ago, brothers and sisters. But this is a generation that has seen not only the, the prophetic sign, but they've seen the social signs, the breakdown, and everything is moving toward an end. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning, Lord, take these words. I pray that, God, I haven't said this to hurt anyone, but we're all mortal. We're living here on this world. And there's thousands and thousands upon multiplied thousands. Yes, they are seeking to do their best to mold this world into a new era of concept of thinking. Yes, they put you out of the picture. They don't want nothing to do with righteousness. And that's why Isaiah 60 says that darkness will cover the earth. And we know that darkness is spiritual darkness. Lord, help me to say it in the right way. Because, Lord, I love thy people. And I love human beings, Lord. But I can't afford to compromise 
When, Lord, on the news we hear the cry, the plea, why, why? When your word says it would be this way. So, Lord, we just commit it into your hand now. In Jesus Christ's name we ask. Amen. <clears throat> May the Lord bless you today. We'll finish it up tonight, the Lord's willing. And I know we're living in a generation that's going to see it all come about. Holy Spirit, move on me. Stand.